It's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here today to celebrate with you the 50th anniversary of CERN. Poland has a very long association with CERN going back before it became a member. In a period it was difficult for Poland to become a member. And it was a very great moment in 1991 that I remember well when Poland became a member of CERN. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the very constructive role that Poland has played in the governance of CERN since that great moment 13 years ago. I'm not going to talk about CERN, but the things I'm going to talk about are based on my experience at CERN and have a great deal of relevance for CERN, many of them. The examples I'm going to give from science are mostly from CERN or from the physical scientists, sciences because I'm a physicist, but I'm quite sure that a biologist could find equally good examples and make the same arguments that I'm going to make about who benefits and who should pay for science. In 1993, in the United Kingdom, there was an important paper on future government policy on science and technology. And it was based on the idea that science and technology should be funding, should be directed for wealth creation. And it was proposed to set priorities by what was called a technology foresight program. And the mission was, and I quote, to ensure that government's expenditure on science and technology is targeted to make the maximum contribution to our national economic performance and, qu and quality of life. It's very hard to argue with that. And it might seem no more dangerous than saying, let's only invest in shares that are going to go up in price. It's a very good idea, in fact. The difficulty is you don't know how to do it, and the same thing goes for science. And I think that it can even be dangerous to base investment in science on such principles. I now want to come on to government funding for applied and mission-oriented research, and I'm going to give energy research as an example and indulge myself by talking a little bit about fusion that I'm involved in at the moment. We've already argued that government has a responsibility to fund science, basic and applied, that is long-term or non-commercial. This is needed to correct market failure, that industry simply is not going to invest in quantum mechanics, for example, to support non-commercial public goods, protection of the environment, to provide governments with a basis for policy. They need independent advice, separate from, if they take all their advice from industry, we will be in trouble and to keep options open for the future. Energy research needs government support for all these reasons. Industry is not investing enough. I'll give you figures later. It's desirable to carry out, uh, for public goods reasons, R&D on sources of energy that are currently not commercially viable because, for one reason, they may be important environmentally, Secondly, they may be necessary in the future when some sources of energy dry up. Uh, they're needed to provide a basis for policy. Uh, let's take the example of the rem remaining amount of oil. Uh, I think that uh, there is, most experts take views very different from the oil companies, and governments need to have a view on this. And uh, it's a very serious problem, and they need independent advice. And this is needed to keep energy options open. We can't, uh, particularly in the face of declining oil supplies, and to keep different options to spread the risks if some sources of supply become unavailable. So for all these reasons, I think energy research is a good example of mission-orientated research which needs government support, as well as, of course, it will have some support from, uh, from industry. I want to give to divide my remarks on energy into three parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about the looming energy crisis and argue that it can only be avo avoided by developing new technology. Then I'm going to argue that increased research and development is needed with a large component from governments. And finally, that the research portfolio should be broad, including improved efficiency, development of renewables, etc. But I believe the fusion, and I'm going to make the case, must be part of this portfolio, and it will need public funding. So, why is there a looming energy crisis? It's the result of a number of factors. First, world energy use is expected to double by 2045. 
That's extremely easy to understand when we examine the fact that the per capita, per person, consumption of energy in India and China is very, very low indeed compared to us and minuscule compared to use by the Americans. Very small, but thank God it is growing. Those countries are developing. That's where most of the people in the world live. And when you put the growth and the large population together, it's easy to convince yourself that this is a re very reasonable prediction. Secondly, currently 80% of primary energy supply comes from burning fossil fuels. Uh, another 11% from burning wood waste, etc. This not only makes serious pollution, but it's producing carbon dioxide, which is driving climate change. Many of us think that it's actually irresponsible to go on burning so much fossil fuel. On the other hand, uh, there's then another problem, independent of this, that fossil fuels are going to run out. Oil first will be the first to run out, and probably oil production, the peak is going to come in the not too distant future. Which, and oil provides 95% of transport. So we shouldn't be burning fossil fuels, and before long, in the case of oil, we're not going to be able to. But we don't have any alternatives at the moment, large-scale alternatives to replace fossil fuels and avoid CO2 or to replace oil in transport. In fact, today, the only viable alternative that does not produce CO2 that's able to make a large fraction of global need is nuclear, which has political problems. And nuclear only produces electricity, which only accounts for about one-third of primary energy use, although that fraction is likely to increase as oil gets scarcer. Global warming, I believe, is very real and must be taken very seriously. Uh, among the many, many different effects, I prefer to say climate change, actually, than global warming, because it's many effects. And the most serious effect is perhaps the rising sea level. But the climate is a very complex animal, and we are poking it with a sharp stick. And it's a very, very dangerous thing to do. And we should take very seriously the predictions that uh, it will lead to ri a rise in temperature. Here's the observed temperature, and here are the computer simulations. So when the modelers say it's going to go on up following the CO2, I believe you have to take them seriously. Perhaps the most serious consequence is going to be the rise of sea level. If we do nothing about climate change and CO2, by the end of the century, areas currently inhabited by hundreds of millions of people will be underwater, including the whole of Bangladesh, uh, New Orleans, and I was there the first part of this week, Venice, for example. People have put a very ambitious goal to try to limit CO2 to twice pre-industrial levels by 2050. That's going to be very difficult. It's predicted that by 2050, the total world power market will be 30 terawatts. To limit CO2 to twice pre-industrial levels, out of this 30, 20 terawatts will have to be CO2 free. Today, the total world power market is 13 terawatts. It's difficult to think that in 45 years we will be producing 20 terawatts without CO2, when that's the total market today, and 80% comes from burning fossil fuels. To quote the US Department of Energy, the technology to generate this amount of emission-free power does not exist. And it's not going to be produced by industry. The power industries have mostly been privatized around the world, and their time horizons are three or four years, not 50 years. I was thinking of saying something about the oil situation, but I'll just limit myself to one remark. There's a Saudi saying, my father rode a camel, I drive a car, my son flies a plane, his son will ride a camel. <laughs> and the fact is, this may well be true, and I don't have time to go into the argument. So what must be done? We need to recognize the problem and that only new and improved technology can provide a solution. Financial, fiscal measures are going to be important to change behavior, behavior of consumers and to stimulate work by industry, but it's not going to be enough. We need increased investment in energy research. In fact, it's been going down. It's difficult to get figures. These are Department of Energy figures. They reckon that since 1980, 
Uh, globally, in real terms, public funding on energy R&D has gone down 50 percent. Now, this is largely because in, utilities have moved, in Europe anyway, from the, private, uh, to the, from the public to the private sector. But the private sector just stopped the research. In my country, the Central Electricity Generating Board had a good research lab doing long-term R&D. It's gone. So this decrease didn't move to industry. That's gone down also. In the US, very hard to get figures for public funding. But in the US, it's gone down 67 percent between 1985 and 98, just when we need more. What should be the scale of this? Scale is incredible. The energy market is $3 trillion a year, about $1 trillion for electricity. This means that a 10 percent change in the cost of energy costs $300 billion a year. So any technology or research which is going to touch the energy market, even at the level, let's say, of 1%, is going to be a $30 billion a year effect. This is the scale on which we should be thinking about this problem in the view of global warming and so on. Global coordination and collaboration is necessary for the funding and the expertise. We can't afford duplication, and cooperation is essential. The results should be openly available as far as practical. We can't afford to have some parts of the world excluded from new energy technologies for humanitarian and for political reasons. What should be the focus for research? I think we have to explore all avenues. Energy efficiency, yes, but it will ameliorate and not solve the problem. I very much like this cartoon. It appeared in The Economist at the end of May when the price of oil went through $40 a barrel. And the driver of this Drive USA car is complaining to this Arab about oil prices, shouting, too high, too high. <laughs> but not just in America. There are many things that we can do about efficiency worldwide. But unless that's accompanied by keeping prices up, greater efficiency tends to simply use to lead to more consumption. CO2 capture. Can we catch, go on burning fossil fuels but hide the CO2? Yes, we need to do R&D on this, but it's not obvious that it's possible. It's going to add to costs, and it's going to be risky. Personally, I would much rather live above a store of radioactive waste than above a store of CO2. If the CO2 gets out, you're dead, suffocated. The radioactivity, you have warning, you can get out of the way. Renewables, yes. But they are not going to provide a large fraction. United Kingdom, for example, uh, wind is particularly favorable for wind and for tidal power. But it's very unlikely that they will reach 20%, and in many areas of the world, much less. We should do it. We've got to try everything. But it's not going to produce 60 70 80%. The only thing that, in principle, can do it is solar. There is enough solar power. But it's currently very expensive and not where needed. So we need energy storage, but it's going to cost in terms of energy and money. Nuclear fission, yes, at least until fusion is available, I believe. And finally, fusion, yes. Apart from fossil fuels, as long as they last, solar, which is not yet viable or economical except for niche uses, and nuclear, which has political problems and in the future is going to need fast breeders as the cost of uranium goes up, as it becomes scarcer, there's plenty out there, but it's going to get more and more expensive. We've used up the easily found uranium. Breeder reactors are another matter, lots of plutonium. Fusion is the only technology capable, in principle, of producing a large fraction of the world's electricity. With so few options, we must try, although success is not certain. Actually, in a sense, I think it is certain. The joint European tourists at Cullum has produced 16 megawatts, shows that fusion can work. So the big question is not, will it work? It's whether and when we can develop the technology to make fusion power stations that are robust, reliable, and economical. So as I said, I'm going to indulge myself and spend about five minutes telling you something about fusion. I'm not sure why this box has appeared on your PC, but anyway. Um, fusion is the process that produces energy in the core of the star and stars and involves fusing light nuclei. The most efficient fusion process involves deuterium, heavy hydrogen, and tritium, super heavy hydrogen, heated to above 100 million degrees. Routinely, a jet 
we're running with plasmas at 150 million degrees. It's 10 times as hot as the center of the sun. And the reaction is deuterium plus tritium gives helium plus neutron plus energy. We need a magnetic bottle called a tokamak to keep the hot gas away from the wall. If the gas touches the wall, it cools down. The challenge is to make an effective magnetic bottle, it's now probably been done, and a robust container. The advantage is essentially unlimited fuel. The raw fuel from which you make, extract deuterium and make tritium are water and lithium. Lithium is very plentiful and available practically everywhere in the world, and it's a component of batteries. And it's interesting to ask, if you use this fuel in a fusion reactor, the, the lithium from one lap laptop battery, what would you get? The complementary amount of water you'd need to produce the complementary <coughs> amount of deuterium is 40 liters. The lithium in one laptop battery and the deuterium in 40 liters of water will produce 200,000 kilowatt hours. It's the same as 40 tons of coal. That's equal to the electricity consumption per person, per capita electricity production in the United Kingdom for 30 years. This fact tells me we must try and see if we can make it work. Maybe we can't, but we've got to try. No CO2 or air pollution. Major accidents are impossible. That's essentially because where there's a 100 ton core of uranium and plutonium in a nuclear reactor, there's one tenth of a gram of deuterium and tritium in the gas at the center of a fusion reactor. No long-lived uh, waste, it's, and the costs are looking quite good. The uh, disadvantages are the development is not complete or certain, and the container does become radioactive. But the radioactivity, the uh, lifetimes are things like 10 years, and it could all be recycled after 100 years. So it's not a problem for future generations. The status, JET has produced 16 megawatts. And the next step is to build a device called ITER, the International Tokamak Experimental Reactor, twice the linear dimensions of JET, to produce at least 500 megawatts. This should confirm that it is possible to build a fusion power station. The big cash question, as I said, is when will it be possible to make a power station which is reliable and robust. That needs not just ITER, but testing of materials. For this purpose, we need something called IFMIF, the International Fusion Materials Irradiation Facility, which is two rather sophisticated uh, accelerators, which produce, at the end, neutrons with much the same spectrum as the neutrons from fusion to test the materials. This is a $900 million project. This needs to be started in parallel with ITER. If that's done, we could have a few prototype fusion power station putting power into the grid within 30 years. That's what ITER looks like. That's a typical person. The aim is to demonstrate integrated physics and engineering on the scale of a power station. It's four and a half billion euros. It involves these six, well, Europe plus five other countries. It's ready to start, but we can't decide where to put it. Oh, by the way, these pictures that you see are a sort of bare eater, and the actual thing is covered in experimental devices and heating systems and so on, many of which are very similar to those in particle physics or similar technologies. This is the irradiation facility, IFMI. What we need now in fusion is a prove eater and in parallel get on with the materials work. And as I've said, we could then move to a prototype pass plant and have fusion a reality in our lifetimes. This is a proper possible time scale. If we start now with ITER and IFMIF, then it would take 10 years to build them. And meanwhile, we should be designing the demonstrator first re reactor, which will put power, and feeding information from IFMIF and ITER into the design. And when you study the problem, what information do you need from IFMIF, let's say, to design the reactor? How many years will it be available? What do you need from ITER? When will it be available? This is the time scale you come up with. So within 30 years, you could be producing power. This is quite aggressive. It assumes no major surprises, and it requires funding. But let me remind you, the world energy market is $3 trillion. The electricity market, $1 trillion. Meanwhile, fossil fuels are running out, 
and fission faces problems. So these are not large expenditures and they're minute compared to the expenditures that were put into developing fission and they're minute compared to the expenditure that is, um, that the oil companies spend on electricity. By the way, the fusion budget worldwide is about half that of the high energy physics budget. But that's a wrong comparison. You should be comparing it with the exploration budget of BP, Shell, etc. So let me come to my conclusions. First conclusion of the question science, who benefits, who should pay? Useless science is often surprisingly valuable. When companies foresee benefit, they will invest. Benefit generally means profit, though sometimes they will do it for their image. When the benefits are long-term or non-commercial, investment is the responsibility of governments. This is true for basic science and for applied mission-orientated research, and I gave energy as an example where I believe that the world simply must invest a lot of money to prevent the problem of global warming and the end of fossil fuels, and industry is not going to do it. I want to end with some remarks on the choice of what to support and the role of governments. From about 1945 to the 1980s, the funding to basic science was favorable in most industrialized nations. And in fact, most countries accepted the arguments that were put forward in a famous report written by Vannevar Bush, the uh, President Roosevelt's and Truman's science advisor in 1945 called Science, the Endless Frontier, a very influential document. This report argued that money spent on basic research would, sooner or later, contribute to wealth, health, and national security, and that one shouldn't m worry too much about what those benefits might take and wh what might form they might take, when they might occur. And this seemed to be generally accepted, at least through the 1960s, where public funding for basic uh, research in the developed countries grew. However, the increase in public funding then came to an end as public expenditure came under strain, and there were greater demands for public accountability. The UK, the United Kingdom, was one of the first countries to experience these pressures in the second half of the 1970s. And I have quoted you this statement that in the future UK policies should be based on wealth, wealth creation. The Netherlands was another early case, although the reasons there were different. There, there was a feeling there should be more emphasis on science producing social benefits. And that's important too, I'm not arguing against that. Maybe the model went on longest in Germany and the United States and broke down around 1990. In Germany, as a result of the unexpected cost of unification, in the US to the growth in the deficit and the federal budget, together with the belief that the Japanese experience, who seemed to have got by without much basic research, showed that the basic philosophy was wrong. But people don't interpret the Japanese experience that way anymore. The Japanese uh, economy then crashed. And indeed, to some extent, the pendulum is switching back in favor of the Vannevar Bush arguments. Nevertheless, in virtually all the OECD countries, there's some sort of new social contract for science seems to be emerging. And this was exemplified by the UK's foresight exercises, which imply that governments will invest in basic research only if it generates rather direct and specific benefits in the form of wealth creation and the improvements of quality of life. I hope I've convinced you that the demand that basic science should only be funded if benefits could be foreseen is misguided and actually counterproductive. One of the consequences of this, I want to dwell on here in this footnote that you may not be able to read, is increasing pressure in the UK and the US especially on university scientists to patent and protect the science that they do. I think we must be very careful that protective policies do not slow down scientific progress. Let's remember that in the Middle Ages, the tradition was of protection. Technologies were guarded by guilds. They were not made publicly available. They were kept secret. Geographical discoveries were hidden or kept secret, and mathematical proofs were hidden. This only ended in the 17th and 18th century, and it was one of the things that drove the scientific revolution. And open science, whose hallmark is publication, is important 
to, to pro scientific progress. I don't think there's a danger of going back to this closed thing, but I think there's a slight tendency, at least in my country, university of scientists are being told patent things. And that could be dangerous, and we have to look out for that. There's an, another uh, danger, which is that governments generally only think for the years up to the next election. And therefore, they will tend to favor mission-orientated R&D with short-term goals rather than research with long-term goals. And we must argue against that. And finally, in the words of Vaniva Bush, under pressure for immediate results, and unless deliberate policies are set up to guard against it, for the same reason that governments are only interested in the short term, applied science invariably drives out pure science. So if we must guard against it, and I would argue also against short-term mission-orientated research, uh, driving out long-term mission-orientated research, and my final plea is that we should all be on guard against these tendencies. Thank you very much. How should government choose the basic science to fund and which level? I think which science to fund should be mainly on the basis of the excellence of the people because the practical results of basic science are usually very, very important. But they are very unpredictable and they come many years, sometimes 50 years later. Nobody can predict. Therefore, choose the best scientists. After all, brains are much scarcer than money. I think that in developing countries, nobody would argue that they should put huge resources into fundamental science. On the other hand, uh, they have practical problems to solve in agriculture, environment, medicine. They need also some basic science to motivate young people and to provide the right atmosphere for the applied science. So I think. Uh, in the advanced countries, there will be more basic science, but everybody needs some basic science. In the developing countries, the research will be more focused on problems of national interest. Professor, are you a globalist in science? Uh, I am definitely a globalist. As Director General of CERN, I negotiated to make the Americans contribute, the Japanese contribute, the Russians contribute, and one of my I feel the biggest achievement I made at CERN was effectively turn it to a global organization. CERN is a very huge family. Somebody said this because people are from different countries and from around the world. So is it very difficult to manage uh, this kind of organization? Uh, sometimes it's difficult because sometimes there are misunderstandings. But it's extremely rewarding because to work together with over 80 nationalities uh, is very, very interesting from a human perspective, from a political perspective. But it's also sometimes very effective because scientists are trained and engineers to approach problems in different ways. So you put together an engineer from Poland, from Russia, from France, from the United States, they look at problems in different ways. And sometimes they come up with new solutions which individually they would not have found.